Is my place messy? I didn't think I'm it was looking cool. at it behind you. There's a, a box of artwork or something. Well, yeah, I mean, I just, whoa, there's something on my head. What's going on? I don't see anything. Oh, weird. Maybe a glare. Um, oh, just, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of weird to put stuff in front of the camera, right? Artwork? No, it's not. No, no, no. If you can, okay. I want to see. Oh, cool. So that's some illustration work you had? Yeah, for the uh, Osaka uh, Film Festival. Osaka Asian Film Festival. Oh, cool. If I knew how to share a screen, I could show you the color <laughs> version, but I don't know. I don't know. Oh, cool. They're mostly inked. Um, they're going to be end up in a on a poster. Oh. I mean, and then I and I made this thing for Patreon. I was doing these PDF newsletters every month last year, mm -hmm. and then I made a. I went through uh, all my posts and made this booklet of like a best of kind of. Oh, cool. So I made so I put, you know, some of those. I mean, I published some of the minor characters in there. So it's like, it's like the solipsistic zine. It's all about me. It's kind of got like articles about me in it written by fake people, but I've written them. You know what I mean? <laughs> but po poetry by a poem by Clancy the Poet, who's a character of mine, who's in Stroppy. <clears throat> Old bag of shit, etc. Poetry corner by Clancy the Poet. An encasement of skin hiding all sorts of things, organs and germs and waste to be, cheeseburgers and a gray old knot, the brain that imagines these things, fuck you. There's, so, pleasant death, tidings of the leaf. The leaf, the leaf, the leaf, the leaf. The leaf is a monster. It was stuck to my shoe. It was stuck to the moo moo in a motor home too. The leaf, the leaf, leaf travels far and wide. The terrible monster that is the leaf that cares about us. So and so and so and so on. So what the leaf? That's great, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank. Oh. W was Warren Tough Elbow self-published or did you do? Because the first issue was Fanographics, right? First issue was Fanographics in 2014. And then the second issue was self-published, yes, uh, in 2018. So there's quite a gap. Was that the only thing you ever did with Fanographics? Yeah, that's, I guess so, other than being in, like, Kramer's. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, but that wasn't 2014, was it, the first issue? Or wasn't it earlier than that? 2004. Four, 2004, okay, that's what I thought, yeah. Oh, did I say 2014? Yeah, and I was like, wait a oh, second. Again? Oh, whoops, my mistake. No, I meant... 2004 yeah and then 2018 14 years later yeah okay and then uh one of your books that i can never find is called the stacks and it's like yeah. a early drawn quarterly book i guess yeah that was what and they uh when they were doing uh petite livre and they were limited edition i think i think they only made like 1500 or something oh that's why yeah, yeah. and then i made a record album this past year with some people Oh, I didn't know. Wow. Yeah. What do you play? I'm the singer. Yeah, cool, man. Yeah, so I'll show you this. Marmalade duplex. Play the tuna olive village. It's the nice back cover. There's us on the back cover. There's one member here, Teddy Bear Dosa, who actually isn't in the band. He just happened to be there when we were taking the photos. He said, do you want to be in this publicity photo and he said sure so he's the one on the far left what kind of music is it i don't know it's kind of i don't know it's like i don't know i don't want to say like post-punk but i don't know it's not very punk it's it's kind of i like the labels though yeah I'm happy with the labels oh well, wait maybe you can't really see it yeah it's not really up didn't you have an imaginary band for a while? Was oh yeah, for a long time. They still exist. The Schnauzer band. Yeah. It's yeah. So weird. Can't really, is it the glare? Can't really yeah, it's see the it. glare. Yeah, anyway. The yeah, the all-star Schnauzer, all Schnauzer band who 
appear in Stroppy, I've kind of used them as characters. It was a band, fake band that I formed with my friend Jason McLean. So we would make uh, posters and stuff. Yeah. Are you, so you're living in America now? No, I'm living in uh, Victoria, BC. Oh, okay. Cause when you said the West coast, I just think immediately like, Oh, I guess he's in California or something now. No, no, I'm in Victoria, BC on uh, Vancouver Island. I just moved here. I was in Vancouver, but I just moved here like a month ago. How do you like it? I like it. Yeah. It's, it's nice. Have you unpacked and gotten your place all together? Well, that's the thing. I'm in this temporary place, which I actually really like. I don't even want to leave. So I have like part of my stuff uh, I've left packed up and I kind of packed specifically to be like, okay, here's the stuff I have to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, like recent things I have to deal with and I'll just, so right now I have like that stuff out and then other stuff put away, but I have to find <clears throat> a more permanent place, but this place is good. I like it. Well, how permanent? I mean, if, if I feel like you move around a lot and I wonder. Yeah, too much. I mean, I'd like to just stay here. I think I should probably just stay here, like call it a day. Yeah, call it a day. Call as it I, a life. As, as I put it to someone, do my, do my final work. <laughs> yeah. Stay, stay in Victoria, BC and do my final work. I remember I was here. I did, there's this guy here, uh, Lee Henderson, who mm -hmm. teaches the comic class and he, when I, I was in Ontario at the time, but you know, I'd lived in BC before in Vancouver and he brought me out here to do, to talk to his class. So I did a talk with his, cl his comics class and then I did another talk at the, at the uh, <coughs> uh, artist run center here. There's these things in Canada called artist run centers. They're government funded local galleries. But anyway, I did a talk there. And so I was here for a week and I was like, ah, it's kind of, I was I just walking around for a week by myself and I was like, ah, Maybe I should live here. I'll retire here. It's kind of a retirement. It's a bit of a retirement village. So, yeah. Yeah, but it's nice. Are there are there galleries there for you? No, I mean I don't really show in I don't really show in galleries. I don't really have many many opportunities to show in galleries anymore. Like, I, although, although I should say, I did a show recently at a bookstore in uh, Vancouver, Massey Books. Hmm. So they have a nice uh, gallery space upstairs, and I did this show <clears throat> there, um, what it was, was I kind of talk about it in this book I made recently for Coos. I made a Coos mini. Oh, and I, yeah. And I sort of discuss, I mean, I, the character's chop salad. It's me. It's like an autobiographical story. It's called banal complications. It's, I just talked about boring, boring stuff in my life. Uh, over a period of six months, or not boring stuff, I should just say regular stuff, mm -hmm. like logistics. It was when I lived, I lived in Minnesota for six months. And it's kind of about that time. Yeah. And uh, I guess the lead up to, this is like 2016, the lead up to the election. Mm -hmm. I think I had to leave the United States at the end of November or something. But, uh, <clears throat> but the show was uh, these, uh, artworks I called replacement works. I had donated um, a bunch of works to the Hamilton Art Gallery mm -hmm. in Ontario, and it's just their policy where they don't they don't want frames. So I had to take the artwork out of the frames, and I was like, man, it's kind of a waste of frames. I mean, framing is so expensive. You know, whatever. It's just they they have to store the stuff easier. It's fair. Mm -hmm. So I made these works called replacement works, and so I put new works in the frames and the in the artworks I refer to the old works that were in the frames like it says in the artwork like this replaces blah 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 here I'll just grab one yeah let me see it said oh yeah it says this replaces Chauncey boy so the artwork an artwork called Chauncey boy used to be in this and I think the new title was probably, I think it might have been organized process, but I'm not sure. But anyway, and did you you showed those pieces? Yeah, so I showed I did that was my most recent show at a at that bookstore. So I showed I showed those, and it was kind of like a show based around the Kusmini in a way, right? So yeah, so oh, I, have to, I have to track that down. I didn't know that you made a Kusmini. 
Yeah, it came out, I guess, earlier this year. So. so you had a pretty good year artistically. I mean, is that record, did that record come out this year? Yeah, the record came out this year and we're almost done, we're almost done uh, the second record. We recorded the first <laughs> side, we recorded the first side. Yeah. And right now I'm working on the second side, which is actually uh, like a prog rock. Like it's like a, a whole, like, a, like a, a medley. You know how those, you know how prog music, they have medleys. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm joking, they're not medleys, but it's like a, <laughs> it's, but it's a song in, uh, seven, it's in seven parts, I think. Okay. So it's, 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 it's a 16 minute song. So I'm working out the vocals. I mean, for the, the, the first side, mm -hmm. I recorded um, my friend Josh, who's a really good sound engineer. I went over to his apartment and, and used his $6,000 mic as if I need a $6,000 mic. But record, and I said, oh man, I, if, to record the second side, I'm gonna have to come back to Vancouver. And he's like, oh no, you should just get one of these. So he suggested, so I got this, uh, it's just like a oh, yeah. USB mic, so you mm -hmm. don't need uh, to have a preamp. Are you working on any other like uh, books for Drawn and Quarterly? Uh, yeah, I have like, I have uh, one book on the go that isn't a comic book, mm -hmm. but uh, I think the size is appealing. It's going to be, well, I don't know if they're going to want to publish it. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, uh, it's, I think I've laid out like 150 pages or something. It's just all this material from these like weird collage zines and stuff. And then I have another idea for, I kind of, for, I've kind of formulated in the past week an idea for another book, which has essentially started like, uh, with some comics I've already done. Just I'm um, thinking of ways to funnel these comics together. Like this one I did for Kramer's, the latest Kramer's. Yeah. I'm going to start with that and some of the Shrimpy and Paul stuff. And I'm kind of figuring a way to make this kind of uh, a book that I have an idea for. That's sort of yeah. I'm random, like that's cohesively random. I don't know. The that one that you, you, that you, uh, put together for D&Q that's a weird size, is that going to be more like hot potato uh, where it's like kind of artwork and yeah, it'll be, but it'll be like a, I think the appeal of it is it'll be, it's small. Like it'll be like four by six. Oh, okay. So I think that'll be the appeal of that one. I think just cause I think it'll be a nice book. I mean, I have to get, I have to get back to it. I got away from it for quite a while. So. Um, the first book that I was actually trying to figure this out, like what your first book was and was it Shrimpy and Paul? with uh, high water my first real like uh yeah, yeah. self-published like mojo action unit or whatever that yeah was. yeah i mean early i was i mean i was first published by caliber press oh they're, i didn't know that <laughs> yeah yeah man they're iconographics imprint they put oh, yeah. yeah i mean i was self-publishing i i well first i self-published with this friend of mine who was in my art class who was kind of he worked at a comic store. I didn't go to comic stores, but he would bring in comics. Like he was like, here, you should check this out and brought in yummy fur to show me mm -hmm. or like, or, you know, ran kind of random, like Boris the bear. I don't know if you remember. Elf, Elf quest. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> it's particular things. And then, and then I got into neat stuff and mm -hmm. I got more into <clears throat> interested in actually going to a comic book store. Cause I didn't go to those when I was a kid at all. I just read that magazine and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, and then Mike and I, I had this character uh, named Jimmy. So we made these two comics, or actually I think there was three issues, Adventures of Jimmy. And then um, and we made, and then another friend of mine and I made, had a swish barrel and we made uh, Jimmy juice. We made labels for this whiskey, this like, I don't know, swish, you buy like old, it's so stupid, you buy like an old whiskey barrel and put water in it and make swish, you roll the barrel every couple of days. Huh. Anyways, anyway, so maybe that's just too much of a tangent. But anyway, and then I started, I made this book, um, or this comic, Yippee Skippy Yum Yucks. And then I made this comic, uh, Funky Chicken. And then that led to me trying to get pub Funky Chicken, such a stupid name. And then that led to me, me to uh, trying to get published. And I convinced Caliber Press to publish. 
I drew this comic called Boof, which was weird because at the time, Todd McFarlane had a character at Image Comics called Boof or something. So I think he contacted Caliber and was like, is this guy, Mark guy, is he gonna do another, is he gonna do more of this Boof stuff? Cause I have this character Boof. So, the, so that put a stop to that. And then I was, and then I was off to university uh, on the East Coast of Canada, the Maritimes, and I was working on my next cal- caliber comic, mm-hmm. my iconographics comic called Hep, and um, he, they didn't really want to do it, and I had to beg them. I had to be like, "Look, can you can you do this? If it loses money, I'll pay. I'll pay for the loss." Mm-hmm. And they and they, they ended up doing it, and I was doing things like I took ads out. Like I took an ad out in the comics journal. Like I paid. saw that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, in fact, Hep is. It's funny that you had a comic called Hep because that was like one of my very first mini comics. Was called Hep, and then oh, funny, really? Wow. Yeah, and then I worked at Kilgore Books, and they had like a, somebody brought in a box of really old comics journals, and I saw your ad in there at the yeah. time. I was like, oh, Mark Bell did a comic called Hep too. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> and then, oh, that's funny. And then, and then I, and then after that, I started. Then they finally were like, no, we can't, we can't do this anymore. And so that's when I uh, started self-publishing again, doing MACU number one. Well, and, then, were you going and, then, and, then, and then, and then started publishing in um, Exclaim. At first, at first I was negative about it. There was this free, sorry to interrupt, but there was this oh, free yeah. uh, uh, music uh, newspaper in Canada called Exclaim. Mm-hmm. And they, they contacted me and said, do you want to do a monthly strip for us? And at first I was kind of like, oh, I don't want to do that kind of thing. But it was actually a really good thing to do because, because the Exclaim just goes everywhere. They like would go to little towns. Like for the longest time, I'd have, still have people coming up to me saying, oh, I saw your comics first in Exclaim. And, you know, whatever little town I'm from, because it's just this free music newspaper. And they had Mark Connery in there. Joe Ullman was in there. Fiona Smythe. Oh, you know, Alan Hunt all these people and uh, you know, it, it was just a good way to get work out. And that's where I developed uh, Shrimpy and Paul. Oh, okay. So they, yeah. that was the comic strip? It was a Shrimpy and Paul strip? Well, first, the first one was uh, Monsieur Moustache and Friends. Mm-hmm. I was drawing Monsieur Moustache for the university paper a little bit. I mean, though, though I, and I went back and scanned all that stuff and I was going through it. I'm like, ugh, so, ugh I can't even barely look at this stuff. But the, yeah, the first Explain comic was um, Monsieur Moustache and Friends, and it was like half a newspaper size. It was pretty big. Yeah. And I think by the time I started, I can't, no, I think, oh no, and then for a while, the shrimp, then I started Shrimpy and Paul, and it was like half page size. And then, and then they squashed it to a quarter page size. And then I was like, oh, I still want to get the same amount of work done. So I just jammed like the same amount of panels almost in like a quarter size. So. People are probably like. I, that right reminds right? me of. I remember the Shrimpy and Paul book. Uh, didn't you like have like a cutout of one of the strips with like a mean? Wasn't there like a mean letter that somebody had written to the paper about your comic or something in there? Oh yeah, that was actually. Um, uh, I think to the coast. I, then I started doing a, a weekly. Uh, <laughs> for the for the coast in Halifax and for, uh, the Montreal Mirror. And I think that letter, I think that, the, you mean the cartoon, the comic strip that someone drew? Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just like vaguely remembering this, this like uh, maybe towards the back of the book or something. There was like, a, I think you clipped out one of the panels or something. It was in the book. And then there was like, you also clipped out like a letter that somebody had written to the paper about how they hated your comic or something. Yeah, I think that was, yeah, I think, yeah, that was great. They, and it's it almost like it, these two people, if it was two people working in tandem, because because there was a comic strip drawn about how much they hated my work, which I love. I kind of just love that oh, stuff. Like, yeah. I'm like, wow, you're going to all this trouble to, oh, yeah. amazing, right? And it's, and it's, and it's like really bad. Mm-hmm. I mean, the drawing seemed competent, but it was just completely stupid. Like it was a pie in the face at the end or something stupid. And then someone else uh, wrote a letter at the same time and they used some of the same language. So I was like, is this the same person or is it just these two friends who are just so angry that my comics are, and then, oh, and then, in, I don't know if you noticed, I don't know if you've seen Warren Tough Elbow, Elbow Number One, but. I have it, yeah. Uh-huh. There was also this uh, 
series of letters written by, oh, I don't know if I, maybe I printed, I can't remember what I printed in there. Well, anyway, there was a series of letters, really crazy letters that the coast didn't even want to show me that this person was writing to them about my work and it was like really out there and I was like no please show me these letters <laughs> like and they were totally bananas like this person was I don't know how they were processing my weekly but it was pretty interesting what they were going on about mm. very angry and yeah kind of amazing language yeah it's similar I did a weekly strip in Denver and um the paper just would at that point this was like 2007 they were just like not really getting that much mail. So like any mail they got, they would print it and there'd be all these mean emails about my comic that they would just print in the paper. And they, <laughs> I was a very young man at the time. It just always like hurt my feelings so much. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, fair enough. I don't know. Yeah, did it really actually get to you? Oh yeah. I mean it did now, you know, I mean you get tougher over the, over time, but well, it depends yeah. on what it is, like how mean it is. Yeah. But they were really pissed off because when the paper started running my strip, they stopped running Durf's strip, the city. Okay, the city. Yeah, I remember the city. I think I was on the same page as the city. Yeah. For a while. Yeah. So people thought that I took Durf's spot or something. And so, like, all these mean oh. emails would come in and they just would run these. these wow. <laughs> you're, like, <laughs> you're, like, you're, like, you're like, no, it's not up to me. Yeah, I might have even, in fact, like written like on in the margins, like I didn't take Dirk's comic space or whatever of my own. Oh, story. that's good. That's good. I hope you got the picture. Lighten up. <laughs> like I can't even. Do you even read like the reviews of your work? Uh yeah, I get a yeah, I kind of get a kick out of it. Like, uh, like I'll read. I mean, it can be. It can be. I mean, I get it though. It can be depressing. Like you read good reads and you're just like, oh. Oh yeah. This is like. I think you know certain things can you know get to me where I'm I'm like I, I can uh, maybe I block them out but there's certain times where something can really you, you end up feeling like a fraud or something you read this isn't that but isn't that weird though because it's true like they say like you can be complimented like all over the place and that doesn't stick with you as much as like one mean thing that somebody says yeah like there's most things I find kind of entertaining like. I kind of get entertained by people hating this stuff, but some, yeah, there's the odd one where I'm kind of like, Ooh, yeah, I can't, I'm yeah. trying to think of one that I can't, I probably, maybe I blocked it out. It was so painful, Noah. Yeah. Or the few that I blocked out, they were just hurt well, me so much. <laughs> I think it's when somebody hits on something that you kind of feel about your work, but you're hoping yeah. nobody else notices. That's it. That's it. And some people can really like, like, yeah. ugh, they know how to, <laughs> Turn so when you were doing the comics for Caliber and even like your self-published stuff, would you go to comic conventions and like set up and, or, or sit at the publisher's table or anything? I did. I, I did. I went to, um, I went to, I remember going to one in London, Ontario, where I grew up. <laughs> and uh, By the way, I just want to say really fast, it's really funny that it's like, Mark Bell was born in London. You're like, oh, Ontario. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not from <laughs> but the, but um and i mean i was kind of fascinated i mean i was kind of fascinated by this strip in the local paper called holding up well which was mm -hmm. by these two guys i was kind of fascinated by the, that strip so i was kind of fascinated they were there as well uh -huh. i can't really explain this strip i mean it's just it was just a local daily comic strip called mm -hmm. holding up well which was by two young men about uh an old man, I believe. But anyway, they were there. And then I would go, um, I think I did go maybe to one in Toronto too or something. But then I started going to these, um, but then zine fairs became popular and Toronto for, for a time was, was pretty great in a way because they would have a lot of kind of literary uh, book fairs, you know, like so it would be comics and it would be uh, different, different kind of, kinds of publications like zines in general and comics and mm. I can't remember it was just the Toronto I can't remember the name of these the name of that particular one but then there was uh but then you know Broken Pencil started up oh yeah this uh zine review magazine and they had a little fair and um and then I guess more more recently is uh Zine Dream maybe uh filled filled the gap there 
Yeah. So, but I was, so I wasn't, so I wasn't really going to comics festivals until, um, I guess early 2000, I guess early 2000s when Alvin, when Aventura start, was interested in my work and, and I was started doing some projects with him. So then I would go down, I was in Vancouver at the time and it was easy to go down the coast. So I would go down to San Diego and then, uh, and then, cont- and then I went down when, uh, for when High Water was there and stuff. High Water would share a table with, uh, with, uh, uh, Sammy, I think, if I'm not mistaken, when Kramer's was coming out. So Tom approached you about, uh, collecting Shrimpy and Paul because he had seen it in the newspaper or something? Well, he would order my, my, uh, books to, uh, Million, Million Year Picnic. So he was, he was familiar with the work through, through there. And then, you know, and then once he was interested in making the book, it really kind of helped guide me with the, uh, monthly comic strip I was doing for Exclaim because I was like, oh my God, okay. So, so I started thinking about it more as a book at that point. Like each strip had to build up into a bigger story or something? Well, I think, I think, well, I mean, what happened? I mean, I first serialized the story, the ball, the goose and the power. And I think I, that I made that as a mini comic Mm -hmm. that came out as a mini comic as a, a, issue of macu i don't want to say the whole name because it's so dumb and then uh uh and then and then and then the second and then the second story was about uh paul losing his nipples i don't know if i knew it was going to be a book at that point but i know by the time i was working on the third story i think it's called the mighty king mighty kingdom of shrimpy ub or something I think by that, but maybe it was part, maybe it was part way through that, that I knew it was going to be a book. And then I really started thinking about how I was going to all piece it all together. Those are the three main stories. And then I had all this other miscellaneous stuff. And I, w- I really got into thinking about how I would piece it together. And what, what was the comic scene like at that time? It was like, was this before Fort Thunder and all that stuff? No, they were, no, uh, Fort, Th- when did Fort Thunder? The late nineties, maybe? Yeah, late nineties. So this is like around, this would be around the same time, right? Like th- this was, yeah. it's like, it's like, uh, I think there was, I think I've put it this, some, the same way somewhere before there was something in the water with, uh, these collaborative groups. Cause there was, um, myself and all these people in Canada making these, uh, weird collaborative books, drawing books and stuff. Mm-hmm. and kind of feeding off each other in a way and then over in Winnipeg at the same time I mean we weren't communicating with them but there was the Royal Art Lodge and that was a group of uh, uh, artists in Winnipeg um, Drew Lanois, Michael DeManche, Neil Farber, uh, Marcel Dezama who became the most well-known of the bunch and Holly Dezama was in the group too and Drew's brother Miles and they so they were they were doing all this collaborative work and um they they would come out and then they started coming up to Vancouver then I was living in Vancouver and they started where I was living in Vancouver and they started coming out to do these shows and so we met them and we would draw with them a bit and but you know we both two different groups independently doing kind of similar things and then and then um Fort Thunder I mean they weren't really doing collaborations in the same way but they were still like this you know a gang of goofballs or whatever i shouldn't call them i shouldn't call them goofballs but <laughs> you know, a gang gang of you know a group of artists uh doing this crazy stuff so they were it was kind of all happening around the same time mm-hmm. you know so and what was that there's this book that brian ralph did called like fireball maybe or something like that do you know yeah this? did you do something for that were you are you in that book somehow no, but I think I think Tom messed up the ISBN and gave I think Shrimpy and Paul, Shrimpy and Paul and friends shares ISBN with Fireball I think or something like that. Okay, maybe that makes sense. If you look up Shrimpy and Paul and friends Fireball, yeah. Up, so I think they might have the same ISBN. Okay. I don't think I've ever seen Fireball. <laughs> yeah, is that does that book exist? That's a real book. I don't know. I mean, maybe, I don't know. Let's, we should ask Tom. We should leave Tom should pop up in the corner. Yeah, I know. I wish it, let's bring Tom in right now. He's a <laughs> oh, clear this up. What, what really happened? 
I would like to talk. I should actually reach out to Tom and have him because I'd like to talk about high water because that's a really interesting. Oh, you should. I mean, it is interesting, right? Like, like it was kind of the beginning of you know the graphic like, novel as we know it. Right? Yeah, like beautiful paper stock, like more more thought going into yeah the rounded corners, the author yeah. photos on the back, weird weird choices. You know, a lot of my stuff's still in storage, and I hope I have this one book you put out. Um, by this writer, I can't remember the writer's name, but it's got pencils on the cover. Did you, know, did you ever see that book? No, I don't think so. Oh, not, uh, not comics, but I can't. I wish I could remember the name of it. But hmm. you know, it's just this nice little book of writing. I don't know. Oh, okay. Um, it's, it's not an art book. It's just like a, a collection uh, of essays or something. Oh, it's it's uh, so it's writing. It's just writing. Yeah, it's like. Uh, I can't even remember if it's poetry or prose or what. I, yeah, I, I should remember like I just remember liking it. I haven't looked at it in so long. There's a kind of I miss the kind of quaint, I don't know, low key quality of things. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I remember I was talking to Eric Reynolds about this. Like I remember when the biggest controversy in comics was who <laughs> uh, Alvin Buenaventura versus D and Q for the right to publish Vanessa Davis. <laughs> who does Alvin Buenaventura think he is? <laughs> yeah. Alvin was a lot of fun, man. Yeah, I mean, well, Alvin and I, Alvin and I had a big falling out. You know, we had. So oh, I didn't know that. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm a bunch of trouble. We had a big falling out. Uh, yeah. when was that? Um, uh, he, I mean, he was going to publish what became Hot Potato, okay. and uh, I said, "This is kind of how it became called Hot Potato because it got passed around." Whatever. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I, I made it, Alvin, we had a falling out, but then later, later it was fine. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I was like, Alvin, this art book, I'm going to need to take uh, some nice photos of this art because I can't scan the stuff that has little shelves and things. Mm -hmm. so I said, look, I'll pay for it. I'll pay for the four by fives. But then it has to be written into the cost of the book. And then you get so you then you pay for the book and then uh when you make your money back that's great and then i get and then after that i get my my money back for the photos mm -hmm. and he said no no the the artist is responsible for supplying the artwork i'm not paying for that and i said oh and then he said oh, okay and then he said so feel free to take it somewhere else so i said all right so, so I took, so then I started, and I think he's kind of moving on from me. Like I was one of his early guys and he was, you know, Alvin was, a, he was an ambitious guy. Not yeah. Alvin, he was an ambitious sure. guy and he, and he, he did well with his ambition, with his ambitions in the comics world. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I took it to, or I talked to Dan Nadell and I was like, Dan, you want to put out this art book? And I think at the time, I was having, like, I was going through, like, kind of a personal crisis. Mm -hmm. I think Dan was looking at me going, well, okay. And I think Dan, I think at the time, Dan was facing a lot of big bills, mm -hmm. like, for the giant Panther book and stuff. Oh, yeah. So, you know, and he was, he, I think he was thinking, mm, this would be a cool book, but I don't think Mark should put it together. And he started, which is fair, because I can be too um, detail-oriented mm -hmm. and not see the bigger picture. Um, and can run, you know, and things can kind of go, I don't know, I get, I, I'm, I'm better with that stuff now because now I just don't care as much. But I think at the time I was really, I cared too much and I got, I buried myself in, in my own bullshit. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but Dan said, what about if we get Ben Jones to design it? And I was open to that, it's kind of, oh man, that'd be kind of awesome. Ben Jones' eye on that shit, like probably would have been kind of neat. Yeah. But anyway, but anyway, what happened? But then Dan was like, but look, I don't want trouble. I don't want trouble with, with Alvin, which is fair. So is this okay? Like with this. And I said, yeah, he invited me. He, 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 he said I could take it somewhere else. So as far as I'm concerned, it's fine. Um, so he, so Dan was going to do it, but then, but then, you know, he was, he was facing a lot of stuff and he was facing, facing me with this detail oriented book. Mm -hmm. And then I think he did the logical thing and, and talked to D and Q about it. And they were, they were, they, they were interested in doing it. So it, it kindly was passed to 
D and Q, and then they they published it. And that's why I called it Hot Potato because that was the third that was the third place it had been. Right? Who's gonna so, whoever who? when the music stops? Who has to publish this? Thing? <laughs> Or whatever you know i don't know who was in charge of actually taking the photos that you needed though who actually did that for you well i had to do i had to hire the i hired this oh, um I, I i would go i would you know this is when this was my whole other career when i was working with down gold in new york and it was crazy it was amazing it was like it was like basically like a art factory like just pump trying to pump out all this artwork because he mm -hmm. was he was managing to sell it like i think he sold like like all my best, all my best artwork was sold in New York. I think I think he sold over two hundred pieces or something like that. Wow! And um, so I was constantly uh, shipping stuff to him, and so I, I get obsessive about documenting it, of course. So I would take it. I, I think I think the for, I I I think I was taking I was taking it to this. Oh yeah, that's right. I was taking it to this place in Vancouver. They had this crazy. Um, uh, digital four by five setup. There's this really super sophisticated uh, uh, copy, digital copy stand. Mm -hmm. So he would he would take photos of the stuff, and it looked good, but he would always put this like weird uh, filter on it. So when I looked at the stuff up close, it just looked kind of weird. And even though it was this really high quality machinery, I just be like, is this right? And that's what I'm talking about, burying myself in details. Yeah. I'd be like, is this right? So then I just convinced myself I need to get good four by fives. So then I went, so I went, and I think I even got work back to photograph. Like I was just being so obsessive about it. So I, so I, then I took work to this, he was a, I remember him being a real dick, this guy who, who really knew what he was doing with taking like analog uh, uh, film four by fives. Mm -hmm. And I had him shoot the work and he, he did, he did a good job. He was kind of a jerk, but he did a good job and he was, char you know, it, was, it wasn't cheap. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, and then the stuff, and then the stuff had to be scanned and then those had to be scanned, you know? So it was, you know, it's like this, I was trying to, but you know, I was, I was doing the whole thing. Like I was that hot potato book. Like I was, I think I, I ran into problem. Like I was saying, like I bury myself in detail. So, and I wouldn't want to bother anyone about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, didn't want anyone to have to be part of my problem. So I was really trying to learn how to do everything myself. Um, and, you know, hot potato was like, I did the whole, like I did the whole thing. Like I, Oh really? You laid it I mean, out they, they, I mean, they helped me, D and Q helped me with copy editing and stuff, but I did all the design, all the layout, I scanned oh, everything, God. but you know, but I got tip, you know, but you know, I got some good tips from, I remember Chris Oliveros giving me some good tips about color, like adjusting color and stuff and that kind of thing. And, 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 but the, you know, the, the DNQ just wanted to get it out of my hands. <laughs> I'll be like, send it over. And I'd be like, it's not ready yet. And he's like, well, we can edit it after I send it over. And that was a mistake. Cause then it just becomes too much oh, back yeah. and forth, but whatever. I mean, but the book, <laughs> the book turned out, it's a, it's, I guess it's an interest. There's a few flubs, but you know, you just live with it. What was the uh, what was the color the advice that Chris Oliveros gave you? Did he tell you to turn down the color a little bit so or something? Well, like I don't know. He said two simple things to me. He said, "Okay, if you're adjusting a black and white drawing, use brightness and contrast. Put was it brightness at eight and contrast at fifteen, and then you get kind of a nice looking live drawing. That's not that's not a bitmap, you know. That shows it as a yeah. as an object, you know. Yeah, yeah. But that, I mean." I think that, I mean, I, I always remember that. I mean, I just took it as some weird rule of thumb from then on. And then he, and then he was like, oh, and uh, to adjust colors, uh, I forget what the, I'd have to look in Photoshop, but just this um, adjusting color, like you go in and you, you, you uh, 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 tweak the red and then tweak the, tweak the different uh, colors. Hmm. And he's like, oh, don't, I, I mean, I, I wish I could remember what it, what it is, but he just showed me this specific way to adjust color that I've actually used since then. Huh. So it's like, so it's like, there's a, you, you set it on white and then you can take, you can take blue out of the white or black out of the white, of, of the whites, of the whites. And it kind of, it does this general thing, but it's, it, it really helped me um, with uh, adjusting color. 
So yeah, I love that. I feel like everybody has their own little quirk when it comes to yeah. Like there's probably a lot of different things that do on there that do the same thing, right? I so. guess so. I, I mean, I've I've had to figure out everything on my own. I never, you know, like I I uh, I didn't really know how to color at all until I was dating this woman, and she told me she was like an art student, and she showed me how to use layers in Photoshop, and that like yeah. revolutionized how because oh, yeah. before that i would just do the paint bucket fill because i didn't know what i was you know i didn't know how else to do it yeah so if i had something that was heavily crosshatched i'd be like well i guess this is not going to be in color because i can't go into yeah. each thing and, and click you know so yeah and then i learned i guess and then I, before all that i'd learned a lot of stuff from like jordan's uh you know jordan crane doing all his research and figuring out okay here's how you make a bitmap and you know around the time uh, i was working on the kramer's Kramer stuff. I was figuring that kind of stuff out, like learning how to learning how to color uh, properly on a different layer. Mm -hmm. And then I think I think I read. I either he or either he explained it in a weird way, or I read it wrong. But when I was coloring my story for Kramer's four, I was it's insane. It was so detailed. I was literally doing it with a paintbrush in Photoshop. I wasn't selecting areas and filling them. I was it was crazy. And I gave myself a carpal tunnel syndrome oh my god and then i think uh i was messed up and then uh for a while and then tom actually colored one of my uh, this is around the time when i was doing my uh vice comics song comics and i think i i just drawn one for um uh mick jagger song let's work and i think uh tom filled in and colored that one because i couldn't i literally couldn't do it i couldn't so well, are you still with Adam Baumgold, that gallery? Or no, he, no, he dropped me, like, he, I, I looked at the website one day and I was gone. Like, there was no... Were you like, oh, I haven't heard from Adam in a while, Adam in a while and you went to the website and you're... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he, he pretty much, he pretty much forgot about me and, like, like, after the hot potato show. I mean, these things have, uh, I mean, the funny, the ironic thing about that is, is I was his bridge. I mean, I'm not trying to whatever who cares but mm -hmm. i was he wasn't showing any kind of comic art at all i mean he was showing what was he show? i mean he was showing comic related art and mm -hmm. cartoony art but he wasn't showing like comic pages and then he started showing my work and he knew of course he knew i did comics but i kind of switched over to fine art and we showed <clears throat> in my first show we showed a uh gustin um mm -hmm. like gustin strip that i made for uh the gansfeld Mm -hmm. um uh, we showed that and some like this guy collect mickey carton this collector bought the whole set or something wow. and uh but then he wouldn't he wouldn't really show anymore and i'd say adam do you want to show some of my comics and he'd be like no it's just good no mark it confuses people so i'd be like oh, okay but i think we we may have showed a little bit of that i can't remember in the the last show, Hot Potato, but but ironic. So he wouldn't show the comic art because he thought it would confuse the collectors. But then, you know, but then who comes through the door? Like Linda Berry, Seth, uh, Chris Ware. Maybe Chris Ware was first. But you know, those are the head. Those are the heavies. Yeah. And you know, I got. I think what happened was that 2008 financial crisis hit, and all the funny money disappeared. Mm -hmm. So Mark Bell, you know, fun equals funny money. I think in a way. Whereas like Chris Ware equals like solid money. Yeah. You know, so I think um, Adam, uh, I, you know, his, you know, galleries were closing in New York. There was like a, there was like a blog gallery death watch where I think like galleries were dropping like flies. Um, that sounds a little dramatic, but it's kind of true. And uh, uh, you know, of course he survived. He's been around so long. Um, but uh I think he just realized, oh, there's a, you know, there's this market for this untapped market for all this, for this other stuff, like Ware and Charles Burns, obviously, you know, so, so, mm -hmm. and Linda Berry. So he, you know, he just, he went with that. And then, yeah. and I was still on the roster for a while, but yeah, but, but then I forget what year it was. I looked and I was like, oh, no, no, there I'm gone. <laughs> I'm gone. I'm not, I got, I'm gone. The fickle art world. Now I don't exist in New York anymore. These people I, I, use you. You know, they use you and they, then they lose I you. Used to, I used to be somebody. <laughs> but I remember, I remember doing, I hadn't, I remember it was so excited. My first show and my first big art, real art show 
was there on the Upper East Side in New York. I hadn't been to New York since I was on a class trip and I was coming back to New York like with a, my own art show. I mean, to me, that was, I'm just, a, I'm just a guy from London, Ontario. And I thought to myself, oh man, this, is this it? Like, am I just gonna be able to do an art show every year? And, and you know, that's amazing. Like, is this what's happening right now? Cause you know, the first show got like a New York Times review, like a really good review. And the first uh, three shows did pretty well. And mm -hmm. I would be like, oh man, this is pretty good. Like usually it drops off after the first show, but then, but like, but then the, you know, the funny money situation. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and just, you know, and I didn't, I didn't make a, there was, I think in, what is it in, in New York, you either, you have to make some kind of crazy leap uh, or you have to have some, like Adam is mainly a resale gallery. So he's not, he's not going to build careers. Like mm -hmm. that's, something maybe a Chelsea gallery would do, I suppose. Because the neighborhood where Adam is, Upper East Side, that's like, you know, it's like, it's like uh, blue chip artists and dead artists. It's, it's, there's no, not a lot of young artists showing up there. So it's pretty interesting. I mean, and, and I don't want to sound like I'm knocking Adam because that, yeah. you know, he, 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 that was an amazing experience doing those shows there. But, that's really interesting. What do you mean by you have to make a leap I don't know. I mean, I, you, well, you, you have to make a leap. You either have to have some uh, Chelsea, Chelsea gallery behind you who's like, you know, um, uh, I don't know. You just, you just have to make some kind of like, either I, either I had to make an artistic leap artistic that would have, yeah. that that either I would have had to make some crazy artistic leap that got noticed mm -hmm. or, or an artistic leap would have had to have been shoved down people's throats or something or the right people. I don't know. I don't want to sound like I understand it all. Do you I don't think like, it's like, it's like a 1% thing. I mean, it's like a, yeah. like who's, who, who, who makes it in the art world? Like barely anybody, you know? And that's, that's, that's how it goes. Right. So like if like art forum had like written like a cover feature on you, that would have been a leap. That would oh yeah. But that just wouldn't happen. Like, I don't know. Why like, wouldn't it have happened? Well, we barely get covered in, like, juxtaposed. We barely cover, we cover, you know, like, I don't know. Like, it's just, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. I'm curious I mean, about that. I just can't, I just don't think I have the, like, I just don't, like, I'm not knocking my own work, because I think my work's all right. I like it. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, it just doesn't have that uh, art, uh, enough art bullshit going on in it. I don't know. Like, right. But no, I'm not, but I'm not knocking that either because like, you know, I like, like, you know, like, you know, Jim Shaw or something or, you know, that's cool shit. Like, like crazy, mm -hmm. crazy American art, you know? Do you, what, what era did you make the most money? Like, was there a, a time period in your career where you were actually making like real money and you're like, this is great. This is how the rest yeah, of Yeah, I guess, the, I guess when I was showing, uh, showing, let me just do my hair. I was showing with, I guess when I was showing with Downgold was, was that, was that time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then I managed to sell, uh, then I just didn't have like, you know, then that, you know, Downgold that I took a, uh, I was, I, I, I'm real, I've been really good with money. I was like in my twenties, I was so determined to be a cartoonist. I lived so cheap. It was crazy. I was so stubborn about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I would, I would live really cheaply. I just wanted to do it. I didn't want to, I didn't want to join the workforce. I mean, I was washing dishes and doing dumb shit like that, but, but I haven't worked since, I haven't had a job since like 99 or something. I think my last job was in Halifax. I was like a, there wasn't even a job. I was like a DJ at this club and I'd work nights where no one was there. And then periodically people would come in and want to dance and be like, I don't have, I don't know, I don't know what to play for you guys. Like, that kind of <laughs> but, um, but um, I guess the, that's when I was with Bound Gold was when I was kind of doing all right. And then, and then you were getting a lot and of, it, good. and then it, what's that? Yeah, then and, then I, and, I, and I had a buffer. I was, I was always trying to keep, I always had a buffer. Yeah. And then, and then the buffer started uh, uh, disappearing and I was kind of getting freaked out. And then I applied for a Canada council grant and I got that to make Stroppy, which was great, but it was pretty funny because after you know, I, I was at some event, in Toronto, word on the street, signing Stroppy, and this woman came up. And she's like, "Oh, that's oh, there, that's you." She's like, "I shouldn't be telling you this, but I was on the jury 
and we and we can you believe that we awarded you this grant and i was like what that is like the rudest like that is so rude i was like why did you tell me this so you so you guys decided to give me this grant but 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 you're laughing about it about how it was a joke and i know my work is crazy and everything but it's like whoa why are you even telling me this yeah it's rude and you're not and you're not actually supposed to do that you're not supposed to talk she should she should just really literally shouldn't have done that yeah and she was basically laughing at me it was crazy i was just like Ugh. so anyway i got a grant to make stroppy i mean i've gotten a lot of travel grants but not uh uh i've gotten a couple I've gotten a, that the grant to make stroppy and i got a grant uh from ontario arts council as well but mainly i've just gotten travel grants i haven't been sustained really by the canadian government at all so, but however, I was happy to get money to make Stroppy. I got like 20 grand. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's not in, in the bigger, considering how long it took me, it's like not a lot of money, but, yeah. but I mean, I was very appreciative to get it. And then I managed to sell and then, you know, and then it took me so long to make it. And I'm like, oh, I need another little cash cow to keep me going. And then this guy uh, started writing to me saying like, can I, can I buy some shrimpy pages? And I was like, maybe. And I think I was kind of at this point where I was like, Ugh, I should just, like he was lowballing me, he was crazy. He was offering me like 20% of what a reasonable price would have been or something, like something really low. And I think I was feeling a little demoralized. Like, I, I mean, I should just get rid of some of this paper if I can turn it into any kind of money. So I agreed, I agreed to sell him, uh, <clears throat> I think it was, three th three strips or two two or three i can't remember if it's two or three for like a really low price and i was so annoyed with him he was so annoying that there was one he picked or that he didn't want i was like i'm putting that one in i'm gonna keep this one this other one he picked and I, so i i knowingly put one wrong strip in and and I, maybe it was just two i can't remember but anyway i sent him the strips and he's irate he's like I what he's like you made him, you sent, you, you sent the wrong strip, please send the other one. And I was like, he was really mad about it. And I was like, you know what, dude, you know what, dude, just send me that one back and I'll give you your money back. No problem. And then he did begrudgingly, begrudgingly kept them because he'd gotten such a crazy deal. And then, and then I don't know. And then later, I'm pretty sure what happened was he ended up, he turned around and flipped one of them to Scott Eater. Because I saw because I saw one on Eater's uh, website, so I wrote to, I wrote to Scott and I said I didn't bring up that story, but I said, "Hey, do you are you interested in any uh, tr uh, uh, comic artwork? Because I got a bunch." And he's like, "You have stroppy pages?" And I said, "Yeah, I got them all. Do you want to buy all of them?" He's like, "Maybe." And then he did. Then he bought the book. So so yeah. so that kept. So that kept me going. Were you uh, like a big fan of Seth? Uh, well, I would. I remember reading those. I would buy those early uh, Palookaville things. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Seth. I mean, I, I lived down when I was. I lived in Guelph for five years, like about a three-minute walk from Seth. I think I told this story before, but like this is like the second day I lived there. Chris Ware. Chris Ware and Seth came knocking on the door and it was like in the shower. And I, I think I answered, I think I actually answered uh, my partner at the time and she was stoned and didn't want to answer the door. And then I, so I, had, I sort of answered the door and it's, it's I was like, I'm just be a bit. But anyway, uh, but Seth, I mean, became like pretty good, like reasonably good friends with him. The guy's mm -hmm. hilarious. Go out. The lunch room and stuff. I really wished I'd seen that uh, show in Guelph because the kind of, I guess it, you would call it kind of retrospective. Did you oh, hear yeah. about the show? Did, I, did yeah. I see it? Yeah, or did you hear about it? I saw the photos. I think you published it in one of the Palookavilles where it had all the little houses set up and stuff. Well, this was maybe, I don't know, this was pretty recent. Oh, okay. It sounded pretty extensive. Anyway. I think I, I don't know, anyway, he's like a world world builder, right? Yeah, anyway. All right, man, well, yeah, I've taken a, an hour and a half of your time. Yeah, I think there was a few moments where it was all right.